session on the making of a vision. We're in Antlers, Oklahoma, and we're going to spend tonight and tomorrow night on this course, and then we're going to go to our second course on Saturday morning. So if uh, everybody would like to, if you want to turn to the first uh, page Upon of the three basic steps in the vision process. The first one is developing your own vision. Then secondly, we have communicating your vision to others, and thirdly, developing the corporate vision with others. Um, so we see here that there is a process, and as we go through this process, it helps to begin to expand and to involve other people, and it uh, envelops the purposes for the kingdom of God. God's given each person an ability to discern certain things and to do certain things, that will be a blessing to their lives and to the kingdom as well. Each of us have been uniquely fashioned and formed by God, and he has a plan and a purpose for every life. His plan for us uh, was laid down before the foundation of the world. And so it's not a new thing when ideas and creativity and vision begins to come into our heart and our lives. But God had a plan all along, and he designed for our lives. He's given each person certain natural abilities with which that we were born as well as certain spiritual gifts as the Spirit himself wields. He's equipped us for everything that he will ever ask us to do, and his gifts and callings are without repentance. Those gifts may be uh, just resting or lying dormant within us, but you can choose to submit to God and stir up those gifts to be used for his purpose. Studies have revealed that the average person possesses from 500 to 700 different skills and abilities. Uh, I'm wondering where the 699 other ones are that I have. Um, but anyway, far more than any of us have realized. For instance, our brain can store one trillion facts. Your mind can handle 15,000 decisions a second, um, as in the case when your digestive system is working. Your nose can smell up to 10,000 different odors. Your touch can detect an item one twenty-five thousandth of an inch thick. And your tongue can taste one part of quinine in two million parts of water. You are a bundle of incredible abilities and amazing creation of God. That is pretty fascinating when you think about it. Amen. Uh, Jesus is our perfect example, of course. He came to earth and he lived as a man in order to demonstrate how that we are to live our lives as individuals in relationship with the Heavenly Father and in relationship with each other. <coughs> he was the perfect leader and he used his abilities of self-mastery, action, and relationship skills to train and motivate his team of disciples. When we think about it, Jesus followed three simple premises. The first one was is that one person trained 12 human beings who went on to influence the world in, to such a degree that time itself is now recorded as being before B.C. and after A.D. In other words, you know, that's how we, how we uh, actually manage our calendar. He worked with a staff that was totally human, not divine. A staff that in spite of illiteracy, questionable backgrounds, fractious feelings, and momentary cowardice went on to accomplish the task that he trained them to do. They did this for one main reason, and that was because they wanted to be with him again. His leadership, number three, style, was intended to be put to use by any of us. And that's the, the beautiful thing about Christ, is that when we look at his life and how he modeled leadership, uh, he, it's not that complicated. It's not that difficult. He did it 
with the simplicity, but at the same time, it was powerful and it was life-changing. And we can do what he did. Jesus was a young leader himself who, like a lot of us here tonight, had to depend on others to accomplish a goal. His task was to change the world, and he only had three years in which to do that and to prepare those that would come after him. Uh, so what did he do? Jesus possessed three characteristics of strengths that we can also possess and grow to maturity in. They are the strength of, ma of self-mastery, the strength of action, and the strength of relationship. So these are three powerful concepts that if we take time to meditate on these and look at the life of Jesus, we see that these are key elements into being successful in life as leaders. So as we go through our study here this weekend, we want to open our heart to the Holy Spirit and our minds and receive what God wants to reveal to us about vision um, and about our lives and how we fit into his overall program in this world today. God has amazing and wonderful things in store for each one of us here tonight. If we go to the next page, the introduction to vision, we see the need for vision. Various translations of Proverbs 29, 18 give us insight into the meaning of this verse. Um, Proverbs 29, 18 basically tells us that without a vision, the people perish. And we're going to look here at some of the different uh, translations, which would really expand our understanding. The King James, in the margin, it says, where there is no vision, the people are made naked. In other words, they're exposed. The Amplified says, where there is no vision or redemptive revelations of God, the people perish. The New American Standard Bible says, where there is no vision or revelation, the people are unrestrained. NIV says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Uh, the NAB says, without prophecy, the people become demoralized. The Swedish translation says that where there is no progressive vision, the people dwell carelessly. Um, then other translations say things like, where there are no guidelines, the people run riot. Where there is no word of God, the people are uncontrolled. Where there is ignorance of God, the people run wild. Without revelation, a nation fades, but it prospers in knowing the law. Uh, the FF translation tells us. So the Strong's Concordance provides the following definition of the Hebrew word. Uh, Strong's number 2377, and it's hazan. It means uh, vision, revelation, a message from God with a posit possible focus on the visual aspects of the message. And then uh, the Strong's Concordance also provides the following definition in the Hebrew word, which is para, and it's 6544. It means as being to take the lead, to be out of control, to be unkempt, to ignore, avoid, to be unkempt, to be running wild, to be unrestrained, to let neglect, to promote wickedness, to uncover, to make, to be made naked, uh, refuseth, avenging, avoid, bear, go back, let naked, perish, refuse, set it not. So basically what the Strong's is giving us is this both aspects of this word here that we're talking about right now. Uh, the Dake's Annotated Reference Bible comments, where there is no vision or consciousness of responsibility regarding keeping the law, the people perish for its lack of enforcement. But the one who in such times keeps the law is blessed and happy. So that's a real good expanded definition from the Dake's right there of vision. Number five, vision is your big picture of the way things ought to be. It's your billboard image of what you are working towards. Every day, um, every day as you go about your life, you find yourself thinking about all the ways that things could be better. If you put together all the pieces of how things should be, you have an overall vision. For instance, if you want a neighborhood which, in which people know each other well enough to be able to solve problems together, then your overall vision might read something like this. A neighborhood that is friendly, safe, and clean, one in which neighbors know, like, support each other and work out their differences together. So your vision is the picture of your ideal neighborhood that gets your ideas across powerfully, accurately, and quickly like a billboard. Vision gives direction and motivation. Clear vision based upon God's eternal plans and purpose revealed in His Word and by His Spirit provides direction and motivation to the people. Lack of vision causes the body of Christ to be ineffective in fulfilling the Great Commission. Lack of vision within the local church results in ineffectiveness in ministries and programs. 
Lack of vision results in weak moral character and ineffective Christian lives of individuals. And lack of vision is, a lack, is to lack a future. So if we stop and we think about some of these definitions that we've already read about vision, and we talk about having a vision or lacking a vision or not having a vision, we begin to see here that um, with a vision, you're, basically you are assured of success in life. Without a vision, you're pretty much assured of failure in life. I mean, that's just basically the way it goes. And this applies to the local individual, to the family unit. It applies to the local church. It applies to local government, to the nation, and to the world itself. Vision is essential. And the Bible teaches us that vision is given to us to accomplish God's purposes in the earth. Also, it gives our life definition it gives us identity and it gives us purpose which causes us to be able to understand what parameters we're to walk and live in when God was speaking to Moses uh, in uh, chapter 18 of Exodus he told Moses he said go ahead and choose leaders and put them over all the people so that you can pray and give your time to study of the word he says and then then you will go and you will instruct the people in the work they shall do and the way they shall go Okay, and so this is what's so important. And this is why ministers and pastors, all of us for that matter, need to be uh, clearly understanding what the vision that God has given is and then be communicating that to one another because anyone who doesn't have vision is going to cast off restraint. In other words, they don't know what the guidelines are. That's what's wrong with society right now. What's wrong with our government right now and in this, this presidential race, there's no vision. See, neither party has a vision. And so basically we have renegades in both parties. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. And it's simply because we as a people and as a nation have no vision. And so what happened? We cast off restraint. Now we've got, uh, a one, on the one hand, we've got a guy who's rude, who, you know, is inconsiderate. On the other hand, we've just got a global crook running, you know. And so basically what do we do here? We don't have much choices because we don't have vision. And that's what's happened in our country. And this is what happens to churches sometimes. So number two, leaders need to become visionary leaders that understand God's vision so that they may empower others to fulfill the vision. So as a leader, it's our responsibility to get the vision from God and then communicate it to others. When we communicate to others and they receive vision, it empowers. It does. Once I know what God wants me to do, then I have faith. I have confidence. I am assured that God will back me up and support me in what I do. And this is what is so important that why it's so important for leaders to have vision. Because people depend on those over them in the Lord to give vision and confirm vision. Amen. Spiritual wisdom is needed to discern the destroyers of vision and to overcome the obstacles. Vision statements uh, should be developed and communicated in such a way that it can be implemented. Um, Habakkuk 2 2 says then the Lord answered me and said write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it the idea of the concept that this is talking about was in the day and time this was written cities were walled for protection and uh, they didn't have a local newspaper they didn't have the New York Times the the Washington Post and they didn't have the internet and all these things so what they did was is they would write the news within their city walls on the outside of the wall. And they had runners who ran from city to city. And as they would run, they didn't stop and go in the city because there were people on the walls, watchmen on the walls. And when they would run by, they would shout the news from the previous cities they passed because they read it on the walls of the cities. And so that's how news was passed from village to village and from city to city and from, you know, uh, fortified uh, communities to the other. So he would run by and he would tell what he read in the last two or three cities he passed. And then he would read the wall at the same time from that one. And in the next city, he would tell the, the news of those four cities and read the wall. And that's what this is talking about. It's saying that if you write it on the wall, then it can be followed out and it can be communicated. And so this is why we need to do this. Number three, prayer, dedication, and preciseness are required for vision development. So vision development, it's a skill. That's what it is. It's a skill. Prayer, dedication, and preciseness are required for vision development. It's a skill. You have to develop being able to uh, 
communicate vision, but also being able to walk in, in a vision, to, you know, see it come to pass. And so you develop it over time. Vision starts out with whatever God gives you in your heart and mind, but it begins to grow as you walk in it. It's like walking in the faith. The further you go in by faith, the further you can see. But if you stop and you say, well, I'm not moving because I can't see that far down the road, well, that's doubt and unbelief. But when you walk in faith or when you walk in vision, the further you go, the further you can see. It opens up and your understanding becomes clearer. Okay? Uh, so a real vision gets tucked away in the mind, not the drawer, and it shapes every thought and decision. At the same time, a vision is a spiritual statement of one's relation to God and the rest of humanity. It is the very quality that makes it so relevant to our day-to-day -day experience. A true vision is a blueprint for daily action. And this is a quote from the Forward to Vision Driven Leadership um, uh, writings, book, whatever. And it's by uh, Blanchard. So here we have a chart that I'm not going to go through. But basically it is, it's what's called the trilo Trilogy of Vision Fulfillment. And vision fulfillment requires a theology, which is the foundation for the vision. It requires teaching, which is the formation of the vision. And then teamwork, which is the fulfillment of the vision. And as you look at down through these 11, 12 different uh, areas of theology, you see that once the foundation for the vision is laid out in that area, then you have to communicate it. You have to teach it. Teach it. And then once you teach it, you then can implement it as a team. But all vision requires more than we're capable of doing ourselves. God always gives vision that's bigger than you are. And, and, and if you're a corporate group, it's bigger than the corporate group. It's not unlike Acts 1-8 where the scripture says, And you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's an impossibility. Because in the Greek, the connotation is, is that you're to do all of those at one time. Most churches aren't even successful at winning their Jerusalem, their local city. But yet God says, in the Greek, I want you to do every bit of it at one time. And the idea is, is that God doesn't want you doing it in your own strength and ability. He wants you doing it in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why he said in the first part of that, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now you can do it in the power of God's Spirit. Amen? And so if you want to read through these, you can at some point. But uh, it, because they're, actually they're powerful. And uh, if you were going to be like teaching vision in the sense of to the local church and you were establishing a local church, you would want to cover the theology of each one of these areas, then teach it, and then begin to implement it. That's what's really being communicated here, okay? Now, under Roman numeral number two, characteristics of a leader, the definition of leadership. Leadership is influencing others toward a common goal. That's a quote by John from John Maxwell. Leadership is influencing others toward a common goal. Obviously, a vision is not any good until you communicate it. And then once you communicate it, the leadership catches a hold of that vision, and then together we work to fulfill that goal. Godly leadership skills are needed in every area of life or arena of life, not just the church, but harassment. But harnessing and receiving spiritual energy, wisdom, and strength, you can become an empowered leader to your generation. Influence and goal and a goal are necessary components of achieving leadership. A leader guides his team toward an achievable goal. This is where we're going, in other words. You know, someone's got to stand up and say, follow me. This is where we're going. And that's what vision is. The vision that gives focus and direction to people. When a target is set, others know what is expected of them, and they'll work towards that goal. But when there's confusion, the Bible says there's evil and every kind of thing imaginable. And so it's important to have vision, because when there's not vision, there's confusion. And confusion, eventually, is that place that without vision where people cast off restraint. In other words, that's where you see the church in the Western world today. The church in the Western world has in its pews or in its chairs people that are participating openly in all kinds of sin and immorality that the Bible teaches against. And the reason is, is because there's no vision preached in many churches today. What vision am I talking about? They're not preaching 
righteousness and holiness and the kind of things that set vision in the hearts of people to live right and to live holy. That's why people don't live that way because they just cast off restraint. Do you understand? Sometimes people say, you need to quit preaching about sin or against sin. Well, you don't have to preach against sin to expose sin. All you have to do is cast vision. The Bible teaches a holy life. The Bible teaches righteousness. The Bible teaches a victorious overcoming life from the things of the world. Amen? You preach vision and people will cast off sin. Because why? Because now they have restraints. Amen? People are just looking for somebody to tell them, walk between this line and this line. You know? Live in this area right here. If we just preach truth and cast vision, vision that's given in the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit will bring the conviction. Amen? Amen. So, um, a leader must have, have the vision of a better circumstance and the influence to cause people to follow. Now, influence comes about and it's earned. It takes a little bit of time. It comes through relationship. People coming to trust you. People coming to respect you. But then that leader has to then cast a vision that offers them something that's better than what they have. That's vision. If we're offering people, uh, giving people only to sacrifice, but we're not promising them a better life, most people are not going to go with you. They're not. But you know what? If you t promise pe people a better life, and then ask them to sacrifice, most people will go with you. They'll sacrifice if in the end something better is going to come out of it. You remember Jesus in uh, John chapter 12, verse 25 roughly, when he's speaking to the, to the disciples, he says, I'm about to be glorified. And you can't you imagine, after three and a half years, they're like, oh, thank God, finally. And then he says, like a corn or grain of wheat goes in the ground and dies, and then it, you know, comes forth, and they didn't get that. So then he says, okay, let me put it to you this way. If you want to gain your life, you're going to have to lose your life. You know? Well, that's the very aspect right there. Pe people are willing to give up their lives if they know that in the end they will gain new life. Okay? People just are looking for a better life. So everything rises and falls on leadership. Leadership skills, like any other skill, can be learned and nurtured through time, practice, and experience. There are different types of leadership. Uh, there are many types of leadership styles, but we're going to concentrate on two primary ones. That's visionary leadership and servant leadership. Visionary leadership is leadership with a compelling vision of a better future. These types of leaders have something that they are extremely passionate about or deeply believe. And they seek to find like-minded people to fulfill the vision together with. Sharing the vision is effective and yields results, obviously. Now, servant leadership is an attitude to serve those who are under your care. Servanthood is not a weakness, but it is a strength. You'll win the hearts of the people as they see your heart for them. Um, it's one of the things that we have to do. You can't cast a vision to people and expect them to grasp it if they don't trust you. So how do I get people to trust me? First of all, I show them that I'm a servant leader. Amen? I serve them. I, I give them an opportunity to know me, me. I give them an opportunity to see that what I do and what I believe in and what I see down the road is there to benefit them. Amen? And then you gain influence. Then you gain trust. Now you can become a visionary leader. And you can begin to speak to those things and share those things. And they're able to receive them because now they trust you. They know that your heart as a leader is to benefit them. Amen? So a combination of the two is necessary for godly leadership. Jesus came to give his life and to serve humanity. He was both visionary and he was a servant. Other types of leadership styles would be an autocratic leadership. These leaderships are usually task-oriented. They expect uh, their task to be done and they don't consider it. They do not consider the followers' feelings in their decision-making. Then we have a directive leadership. This is an instructional type of, a, of managerial style characterized by a leader who tells subordinate staff what they are expected to do and how to perform the expected task. Then we have what we call participative or democratic leadership. And these leaders generally seek a consensus on the direction of a group. They're generally more people-oriented, and the feelings and the thoughts of the followers matter to them. So when we talk about qualities of a leader, we can see... Uh, things and you say well why but but I dream of things that never were and I say why not that's George 
Bernard Shaw. Let me say it again. He says, you see things and you say why. But I dream that never, I dream things that never were and I say why not. In other words, you get the point he's making there. Is that uh, if you dream, be positive about what you dream and believe that God can do it. Now, visionary leaders are open to new information. The Proverbs 1.3 says, A wise man will hear and increase in learning. Do you know, um, a lot of people won't listen. A lot of people won't hear anything that anybody has to say, including God. But a wise man will. Amen. So, visionary leaders are open to new information. Uh, they are flexible people. Once they make up their minds, they're inflexible, I mean. Once they make up their mind... They cannot be persuaded, nor do they continue to search for or take in new information. Uh, see, a vision.